Okay. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, can I welcome uh, members of the press and public to the sixth meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2015? Uh, can I first of all ask all those present to ensure that their electronic items are switched off, uh, to or switched off or placed into flight mode, uh, to ensure that it doesn't affect the work of the committee? Uh, colleagues, agenda item number one uh, is the decision taking uh, business in private. Uh, the question is, colleagues, that we take agenda items number four and five in private. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Uh, agenda item number two is a section 23 report of the Scottish Government's purchase of uh, Glasgow Presswick Airport. Uh, before us today, uh, we have uh, the panel members who are here. We welcome, first of all, uh, David Middleton, uh, Chief Executive of Transport Scotland. Uh, John Nichols, Director of Aviation, Maritime and Freight and Canals, Transport Scotland, and Sharon Fairweather, who is currently the Deputy Director of Finance uh, Programme Management at the Scottish Government, but at the time of the airport's purchase was the Finance Director of Transport Scotland. Uh, can I welcome panel members this morning? I understand that Mr Middleton uh, would like to make a brief opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener, and thanks for the opportunity to come along today. Um, to discuss the Audit Scotland report on the Scottish Government's purchase of Glasgow Presbyterian Airport. Uh, we note from the report in particular the key message that the Scottish Government's purchase process was reasonable and that good governance arrangements are in place to monitor the airport's ongoing business and financial performance. We have noted what Audit Scotland said about passenger growth assumptions in the purchase business plan. The business plan was commissioned from appropriate professional advisors who in turn based their projections on analysis from aviation experts. This assisted in informing the purchase process, which, as noted, was conducted in six weeks. We understand Audit Scotland's observation that the assumptions were optimistic, although we also know Audit Scotland's judgment that recalculation using less optimistic assumptions would not have influenced the decision to buy. The purchase business plan was only the start of a process. Since acquisition, it has been a challenge for the board and the press fleet management to deal with the realities of actual passenger and freight numbers and to develop a vision for Prestwick. This was done initially through the appointment of a senior advisor to prepare a revised business plan. This work was completed in May 2014. As noted in the Audit Scotland report, the airport published its strategic vision in October 2014, and this was a combination of the senior advisor's work and other factors that the airport considered may play a critical part in its future business strategy. We noted in our evidence to this committee four weeks ago, the Auditor General for Scotland said that the strategic vision looks reasonable. Of course, there is no quick fix, as has been said on a number of occasions, and is also noted at the committee last month, and there are considerable challenges, and that forecasting the future, as they say, is always difficult. But there is a non-executive chair, Andrew Miller, now in place, we are in the process of appointing other non-executive di directors with commercial, property and aviation or engineering backgrounds. We have, as the report noted, good governance arrangements in place to monitor the airport's ongoing operations. We all want to see that performance improve so that the hope and intention that the then Deputy First Minister expressed in her statement to Parliament on 8th October 2013 can be fulfilled, namely to see Prestwick as a thriving airport return to private sector ownership at some point in the future. Ministers have not set a time scale for this, as the report records, as the long-term opportunities could take some years to take effect. We should, however, recognise the improvements in Presswick's fortune since acquisition. Freight cargo tonnages have grown by 32% since acquisition to a rolling annual total of 12,683 tonnes. This follows cargo lux increasing their weekly service from four to six in early 2014, combined with improved charter and Air France performance. Bristol Helicopter Search and Rescue Base has been secured and construction has commenced ahead of a 1st January 2016 start date. The Trump Organization have decided to base their aircraft at Presswick, linking with Turnberry and their other resorts. Prestwick, as the committee noted last time, has been shortlisted for the location of the UK spaceport. Presswick has redeveloped and sold non-operation on surplus land holdings where appropriate. 
It has worked with local partners to recommence the Scottish Air Show after a 22-year absence. Work is now taking place to build on the success of the 2014 show. The team at Presswick is working on a range of other potential opportunities. And while these are commercially, confidenti commercially confidential at this stage, we hope to see some positive announcements later this year. By working at these and other initiatives, we hope that Presswick will prosper to the benefit of Ayrshire and, of course, the Scottish economy as a whole. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr Middleton. Can I, can I just, uh, first of all, say thank you for your presentation? I have a couple of questions and then I'll pass you over to other colleagues who might have questions as well. i just clarify for the record who the accountable officer would have been uh, during the process of the negotiations that took place? The accountable, uh, uh, sorry, bigger, but the accountable officer for the acquisition was myself. Okay. So, can I just clarify? I mean, obviously, it's not every day. Uh, that you'd find yourself in the position where you'd be acquiring, on behalf of the Scottish Government, an, an airport. Uh, so obviously it requires quite significant uh, responsibility on your part. Uh, can you say without a, any fear of any uh, contradiction uh, that you had all of the information available to you prior to the acquisition of the airport? We had all the information necessary. Can, can I just say, in terms of being necessary, how would you... Expanding Sorry, that. I wasn't meaning to, that to have a significance. We had all the information available to us which allowed us to make the decision. Okay. So in terms of the Auditor General's report, there are issues concerning the actual planning and simulating the reliance on a single operator. Uh, can I just clarify that you had all of that information in terms of the detailed spreadsheets before you at that point as well? Well, I'm not sure what detailed spreadsheets mean in that context. I can maybe ask my colleague Sharon Fairweather to, to expand on the spreadsheets point. In terms of understanding there was a single operator, I think that was very clearly understood. Um, I think the Audit Scotland report referred to issues around the modelling of that. Um, I'm not sure, uh, whilst we accept as a statement of fact that we did not model that particular aspect, we were very clear in our minds that we understood it. And in terms of understanding the consequences and significance of there being a single operator, we were perfectly clear on that. And indeed, I think uh, the Auditor General, in her, in her evidence a few weeks ago, recognised that it was ultimately a yes or no decision. But when you mentioned the issue of spreadsheets in relation to some particular issues, perhaps it would be best for me to invite Sharon to, to say a few words about that. During the acquisition process, we worked very closely with the advisors um, alongside us, both during the due diligence and preparation of the business plan. So we were very clear around the information that they were using as their source information. We were clear about the assumptions that they were applying to that, and we were very clear about the outputs from that. So we had that level of detail in enabling us to do our assessment. The only aspect that we didn't have was the actual spreadsheet models that they used to produce those outputs based on the inputs that we had agreed with them and the assumptions that we had agreed with them. Okay, so can you appreciate the position in terms of what the Auditor General setting out is that there could have been, well, and as we have discussed previously in evidence sessions with the Auditor General, I just wanted to seek clarity that you said you had all the information necessary to available to you uh, prior to the acquisition, uh, but do you think in terms of following the acquisition, do you think there's information that could have been sought during that point that should have been sought? I think you're always bound to know more about assets in the operation of a, of a commercial operation once you are in possession of it and once the management are, in a sense, directly accountable. I think you can always be better informed, and that's almost inevitable when you take over. As you say, it's not every day we do this kind of thing. But there's nothing we have learned since that leads us to revisit or reconsider or reflect in any part of the decision-making process. Uh, I mean, Parliament had clearly expressed... Uh, general satisfaction and general approval of the uh, uh, intention and principle that the then Deputy First Minister announced on the 8th of October 2013. Now, uh, from then on, we had a process to undertake, and whilst there may have been circumstances where we could have gone back to ministers, there was nothing at subsequent... We knew it was a challenge, we knew there were difficulties. After all, it was a statement of fact that it had been in commercial difficulties and had not been making money. That's why its owner was putting it up for sale. That's why it clearly not proved attractive to another commercial purchaser. So we knew there were challenges. Um, and obviously you learn more once you are in the possession of being the owner. But there's nothing we've subsequently found out or learned about the business since acquisition, which leads us to reconsider any aspect of the decision-making process. 
Okay, just for the record, can I welcome uh, John Scott to the committee? I understand and, and note that uh, John Scott's got a constituency interest in the airport. Okay, Mary Scanlon. Much, and I'm sorry I was late. I was in another meeting. Forgive me. Thank you, Mr. Middleton. <coughs> I think we all want Prestwick to be a, a thriving airport. <coughs> you mentioned the freight, and there was a very welcome increase in uh, the airport's freight volumes, uh, and also a significant increase in Glasgow Airport for freight. But I really wanted to concentrate or to focus on the passenger uh, numbers. Um, in the last uh, year, passenger numbers fell by 15.2%. Now, that is obviously a significant fall, and I note in the Audit Scotland report, page 26, that despite the fall of 15.2%, you're projecting, well, you were projecting a 10.2% uh, annual growth rate in passengers, but you've advised that to 6.5. So we've got a fall of 15.2 and a revised estimate of 16.5. But what I wanted to ask, on the back of what the convener is saying, uh, what, uh, I understand that the revised business plan, the passenger growth forecasts, are still higher in each of the five years compared to the Department of Transport's UK aviation forecasts, which I understand are where between 1% and 3%. That's quite a difference between your 6.5%. And I also understand that the Scottish Government assumed higher passenger growth uh, on the advice of its aviation experts. So was there a difference? Where did you come up with 6.5% when the Department of Transport's UK Aviation estimated uh, between 1% and 3%? I hope this is helpful to the committee. I think there are always sources of general projections on the aviation business. The aviation business is an uncertain business. It's a highly competitive business, and things change all the time. Uh, forecasts and projections will be made over a number of years. Now, we knew that there was a much smaller number of passengers than would ideally have been the case at Presswick, and therefore the percentage impact of the Ryanair adjustments in their service pattern in 2014 had an impact, and it makes you know, figures look, in, in, over a short period of time, very difficult. I don't think when we project numbers or we make use of projections, we're saying that those are exact and precise predictions for all services in all circumstances. We're looking at the generality of the aviation industry. We're looking at the generality of projections. I mean, I know that Edinburgh's uh, growth, for example, is above the DFT's projected growth. Now, that doesn't make DFT wrong because DFT's assumptions will be put in a general context for aviation across Britain. But Prestwick is a particular airport, and just as uh, the loss of certain services um, make a big percentage reduction in its business, so that if we all hope it is successful in attracting uh, some new services and some, some route development, that would have a, a percentage increase which we might, might be quite high over a short term. I think it's always difficult to look at these percentage assumptions and compare them over a very short uh, period of months because inevitably some decisions will have a disproportionate impact. I mean, we, we, we hope there is scope for building business at Prestwick. We must all hope that. Um, and we hope that those additional route development will come along. Not that passenger growth is the sole um, uh, generator of revenue in Prestwick. Passenger uh, services are, are an element of Prestwick Airport's income. Indeed, it's probably uh, an, an unusually small element compared to some, some other airports. But we were satisfied at the purchase point that we could see a, a, a a path for this airport to return to prosperity, but we've never said that would be easy. We've never said it would happen quickly. We've never said it would happen uh, in, in a short space of time. There's no quick fix, uh, and it will be a challenge over a number of years. But I, I hesitate to, 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 to somehow suggest that one set of projections is something that we base all our consideration on. I mean, at the moment, we are, we are concentrating on helping the board and the management uh, develop their vision and look at all the business opportunities that exist to boost revenue in Prestwick Airport. 
Well, I can only base my assumptions and my questions on the information I have in front of me. And the information I have in front of me in the Audit Scotland report is that there was a 15% reduction in passenger between 2013-14. There were 29 fewer flights a week uh, by Ryanair. I also have information that the Department of Transport's projected annual growth is between 1 and 3.3%, and that your revised annual growth is down from 10 to 6%. So, if you'll forgive me, Mr Middleton, I'm not making up figures. Everything I have is here in front of me, uh, and I, wouldn't, I would be failing in my duty as a member of this committee if I didn't ask you questions. So, can I ask you again... Were your projections, or why were your projections, three times higher than the Department of Transport's projections? Well, the projections that were in our purchase business plan um, were part of the due diligence we commissioned. It was, it was not a sole piece of work just based on um, projected passenger numbers. It was about a whole range of financial and commercial matters concerning uh, Prestwick Airport. And the, the professional advisers and Audit Scotland, whilst they've made a number of comments on this, have not suggested we did not appoint appropriate professional advisers, and which we provided perfectly credible professional advice. I wonder if I could ask Sharon Fairwell to just add a little bit on the business case assumptions. Yeah, yes, certainly. When we're looking at the passenger assumptions, um, as David mentioned, we, look at, we looked at um, the growth in the um, passengers that we had at that time, but we also looked at the potential for route development and what that would mean for bringing extra aircraft into Prestwick. And as David said, if you bring one, one extra aircraft into Prestwick, you then get a step increase in passenger numbers. I think also when talking about the, the DFT um, comparison, as David said, that covers the whole of the UK, including things like Heathrow, which is a very large airport and which is very capacity constrained, and therefore the potential for growth at Heathrow, uh, in the absence of an extra runway, is constrained and that will have an impact on the overall DFT numbers. So we looked at the overall DFT numbers, we looked at the economic outlook, we looked at the passengers at the moment, we looked at what Presswick's capable of. Presswick has significant capacity, we have no capacity constraint at Presswick at the moment and therefore there are opportunities there to attract additional airlines and we looked at the type of airlines that we would wish to attract there and that's all the type of thinking that went into the work that we did with the professional advisors on looking at the passenger numbers going forward. But also if you look at the um, the report, your, your numbers that you quote are quite correct, um, but you'll also note from the report that post the first five years, our assumed growth in passenger numbers beyond that are below the projections for general growth that, the, that you're quoting from the DFT. So we are looking at a step change in the first five years with renewed management, renewed focus, renewed effort in, in increasing the passenger numbers at Presswick. So are you content in the first five years? Are you confident that uh, you will meet the pa uh, annual passenger growth of 6.5% with Mr Trump and uh, other operators coming into Prestwick? I think predicting the future and being absolutely confident, I mean, if, if, if it was that simple, then a commercial operator would have purchased it. We're saying that we believe, on the basis of the opportunities that exist, um, if we can have an energised management with a well-led board um, looking at all the opportunities, uh, we believe it is achievable. I think there's a difference between going into a proposition you believe is achievable and then stating as a fact that it will happen. I mean, I don't have the capacity to state as a fact it will happen. What I believe is we've put the infrastructure in place. I think uh, we've been, it's been commented on that the governance arrangements are there. Uh, we're in the process of recruiting non-executive directors and we hope that with energy and ideas, things are possible. I think that's the, the, the key thing about Presswick. There are clearly opportunities there, opportunities that are perhaps not in the mainstream of the other big airports and have realised then it can have a success in a place in Scotland. But we can't absolutely predict the future. See, I wasn't asking you to predict the future, but I did ask you if you were confident that your projections were realistic. So please don't try and put words in my mouth that I didn't ask in the question. Okay, I well. asked if it was realistic. I think that's a reasonable question, and I would have hoped for a reasonable answer. Okay, well, I'm sorry if that uh, didn't mean that at all. All I was trying to do was to help 
it discuss the context in which all this I is taking you place. I expect to be mystic Meg, but I do expect you to be reasonable uh, with the questions I'm asking. Indeed. Well, I hope, I hope I'm always reasonable. But um, I, I, do, I, have, I have confidence that these are credible projections. We are confident that the vision for Prestwick is credible and achievable. Whether it will be or not, I think, um, I think is a fair question to say. It remains to be seen. Colm Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to come back to the point of purchase of the airport, before the government started negotiating the purpose, what options did the multi-agency group look at prior to that, uh, and why were, they not, why were they not considered viable? Um, perhaps uh, John Nichols, who I know was um, a regular attender at the multi-agency group, perhaps John, you could say a word about that. Uh, certainly, <clears throat> and thank you. Um, the multi-agency group was convened uh, initially um, about a year before the, the acquisition of the airport, and it was led by um, South Ayrshire Council and included a number of uh, agencies, including uh, Transport Scotland uh, and Scottish Enterprise. Um, and uh, the initial um, strategy for the multi-agency group was to try to secure a, a, a good investor in, in the airport, uh, a credible uh, purchaser from the, the private sector. Um, and, and that was uh, part of our, uh, uh, um, uh, our activity all, all through the process. Um, there were various um, uh, government uh, uh, supports that, support that we could, uh, that we identified that we could, uh, we could offer um, to, to a good investor. Um, we also looked at options around supporting the, 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 the current owner, uh, and those were quite similar to, uh, to those for um, supporting a new investor. Uh, and the other options we, we considered were looking around some sort of joint venture between the, the public and private sector. And we also considered um, various options for, for public ownership, including uh, um, uh, local authority involvement um, and uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, outright um, uh, government ownership. Um, the, the reasons why those other options did not um, uh, transpire is that uh, Infratil, the, the vendor, was, was unable uh, to find uh, a, a private sector uh, purchaser on the terms that were acceptable to, to the vendor. Um, and uh, they had made a decision, a strategic decision, to divest themselves of um, uh, their various airport interests in the UK uh, and Europe, uh, and, and so those, those options were ruled out. The other options um, were not, uh, on examination, were not uh, viable, um, and so that did leave um, uh, the multi-agency group uh, and uh, Scottish Government with the remaining option, which was the one that uh, in the end was taken up. Thank you. At the time, again, at the time of the purchase, or before the purchase, there, were, there wasn't any great uh, quantifying of the economic benefits to the area around about and to Scotland. Has there been any calculation done on that up to now, on the economic benefits of continuing the airport? I think the economic benefit um, was certainly described and considered the business case in the sense of the number of jobs involved in, in various levels. And also, as I think the Audit Scotland reports, the, the gross annual value uh, to the economy locally. But. Um, uh, John, is there anything further to say about the economic benefits in the area? Well, um, what we do know, and, and as David has mentioned, and as the, the Audit Scotland report uh, identifies uh, the significant number of jobs associated directly and indirectly uh, with the airport, uh, and an under, underlying um, uh, above average um, unemployment rate in, in Ayrshire uh, at, at the time of the acquisition. Um, since the purchase, um, the multi-agency group has been uh, reconfigured into a, uh, a, another stakeholder group, which again is led by South Ayrshire Council, uh, and as well as including the, um, uh, the government agencies, the public sector agencies, um, and, the, and the other Ayrshire local authorities, also includes um, the, the airport itself uh, and a number of private sector um, uh, bodies uh, associated with the airport. Uh, and that group is, is undertaking a, a body of work aimed at, uh, uh, at putting Prestwick in the, the right place in terms of the overall economics of um, Ayrshire and Scotland as a whole. Um, the, Ayrshire, uh, the, 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 the business itself, the airport business itself, is undertaking its own work in terms of uh, um, economic uh, contribution and, and viability, um, uh, as, as was being discussed uh, uh, 
uh, with the, the airport yesterday at, uh, at its most recent board meeting. Obviously, some of that is, um, uh, is, is commercially confidential uh, and is as yet at an early stage. But um, um, we were um, in the run-up to the acquisition, the, um, it was clearly identified that the, the GVA numbers for uh, the airport as a whole were substantial, around 61.5 million uh, to the Scottish economy as a whole. So um, there were some, some, some work done prior to acquisition on that. Given that it's quite a unique situation taking on an airport, was there any post-purchase evaluation of the process used uh, to determine <coughs> if there's any lessons for us to learn in the future for any maybe similar large acquisition, should it come about? Well, I think the Audit Scotland report itself, I think, provides some context to that. And I think, um, in many ways, I'm glad that the Audit Scotland report, whatever um, comments it offers, has nonetheless said the, the process was reasonable and that uh, the Treasury, um, che Her Majesty Treasury's checklist of, of issues for the business case um, was generally followed, um, which, given the, the very short period from the decision to acquire to completing the acquisition, um, I think we feel a certain degree of, of satisfaction in the amount of process that was undertaken. Um, I mean, Sharon, I think you could outline a number of the tasks that had to be completed, and these are some of which might be relevant to other investments, but other, others of which were relevant purely to an airport, which has particular characteristics. Yes, yeah, so just to put into context the work that we undertook in that six-week period from... from the time of the then DF, Deputy First Minister's statement, we, we procured and mobilised the advisors, we completed the due diligence, which was financial, legal, real estate, tax, insurance. Um, we developed the, the business plan, the acquisition business plan. We developed the business case alongside that. We undertook the overall negotiations with the seller on the high-level um, aspects of the sale, particularly with regards to the significant debt write-off that they undertook as part of the acquisition. We then undertook the legal negotiations, which is around the sale and purchase, uh, including um, areas such as in indemnities and liabilities, and then covering the debt write-off. We undertook the negotiation of the tax covenants, the interim operations, um, to enable us to continue operating the airport um, without a blip. Um, transitional arrangements with the other airports. They had a number of arrangements across several airports that we had to um, work with in transitional um, uh, arrangements. We also in secured all of the operational issues. So we ensured that the airport was um, properly insured from the point of acquisition, that there was bank accounts s set up and running with money in there to make the payroll the day after acquisition. We did all the negotiations with the Civil Aviation Authority to enable us to continue to operate the airport without um, it having to stop for any period of time. Um, and we ensured things like gas, electricity, contracts, etc. were transferred so that the, the, airport, could the airport could operate um, throughout that period. So that was the body of work that we undertook in a six-week period in order to secure this acquisition. And I think it would be fair to say that I don't think anybody, in an operational sense, will have noticed the handover from the infertile owners to our ownership on the day of acquisition because it all ran completely smoothly um, throughout that period. It's an impressive list. Uh, how big was the team working on this? It was within Scottish government, it was relatively small, um, but we had um, a body of advisors that we worked with. So as I say, we had a firm of financial advisors, we had legal advisors, we had advisors helping with the, with the business plan, we had insurance advisors on board, and the financial advisors provided tax advice um, alongside that. So we had a small internal team, but a significant um, resource attached to that. Before I bring Colin Kieran, can I, can I just clarify, because obviously you've set out quite what you've termed as an exhaustive list of the processes that were followed. D do you accept the, the Auditor General's report that's before you today in terms of its recommendations and findings? Yes. <coughs> so, well, so can I ask then, and just following on from that question, the Auditor General says the Scottish Government's purchase process was reasonable, but the business case could have included further evaluation. <coughs> so do you accept that as well? Because when we, the question I'd asked earlier was, could have anything further been done? So you've advised us now that you've accepted the Auditor General report, but the Auditor General advises us here that further evaluation could have been carried out, despite the exhaustive list that you've set out. I think if we'd had more time, we, c we could have carried out more evaluation. But I think, as David mentioned earlier, we undertook the evaluation that we needed to undertake to provide us with the information we needed to make a decision. And we, we did that, and that's why the report um, 
confirms that our process was reasonable because we had the information we needed to make a decision. But, but, but can we clarify though the significant risk attached to taking a decision in such a short time, not carrying out further evaluation was, was potentially uh, placed in the public process at substantial risk? But I suppose the point I'm asking here is, and I'm, I'm making that point, but I'm also asking at the same time, if you accept the Auditor General's report, then you have to accept the fact that further evaluation should have been carried out. So I, I suppose in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking a straight question for the accountable officer, Mr Middleton, do you accept the Auditor General's report? And if you don't, then it has to, if you accept that further evaluation should have been carried out, then you do accept it. But if you don't, then you don't accept the report. Well, we do accept the report. And I think the, the issue, if I read into the Auditor General's report, certainly when she outlines certain aspects of the business case, it said it should be clearer. I think there are, as there are issues in the business case that could have been spelt out to the Auditor General's satisfaction. I mean, I'm accepting that as a fact, and we could have said more about this and more about that. D do I accept anywhere that anyone has suggested that there was something we could have evaluated which would have led us to take a different decision or to see the decision in a different light, uh, then I don't think there is. I don't think that is what the recommendations are saying. The recommendations are saying there are aspects of of the writing up that could have been different. We have to be clear here. You, you're not here to interpret what the Auditor General report actually says. You, you're entitled to your opinion on it, but I think it's for the Auditor General to clarify that. But all I'm asking you is, do you accept? If you accept the report, the report says that further evaluation should have been carried out. And I'm, I'm not trying to lead you down a particular path on this. I'm just asking you if you accept the fact. I think it will be important for the committee's work to clarify whether you think that further evaluation should have been carried out, yes or no. Yes. I mean, I, I accept the report. OK. Colin Keir. Just for, um, can I just ask one more thing on that? Um, and it's really in, case of, in terms of the time aspect you had from the point where you were... Um, tasked to look at the business case or uh, for taking over the airport. Given the fact that it's six weeks and it's Colin BT, who obviously has a background in uh, uh, finance a little bit more than I do, um, it, it did seem, considering the amount of work that was done, it was done in an incredibly quick time um, compared to the acquisition, say, of that, that Edinburgh Airport, for instance, went through, which was done over a period of many more months than this. Is it reasonable, without going too far into this, that uh, the work that was done uh, up against a time limit from Infratel, from what I can gather, um, it, it was... Was it as much as you could do in terms of getting the information, the work process started, the due diligence, etc., 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 crammed into that six weeks? Was it enough time um, to do that or were you kind of hamstrung with the fact that Infratrol had given you a time limit? We had enough time to get the information that satisfied us, but, but Sharon did a lot of these commercial negotiations, and I'll ask her to elaborate. One of the advantages that we had with this acquisition was that actually the advisors that we um, secured to complete our due diligence had been working on the um, acquisition of the airport for some time for other parties. So they weren't coming in at the start of the six weeks cold. They had already done a very substantial body of work around the financial um, and legal aspects of the business before we came into the process. So they had actually been working for a number of months uh, and we were just able to take advantage of all of that work. So you're absolutely right. In the normal course of a business starting cold, you would need more than six weeks, but we were fortunate that a, a, a significant body of work had been undertaken by the external advisors on the business, including the advisors that were helping with the development of the business plan. They had actually been working with the airport for some time anyway. Um, so we were able to take advantage of that work. Yeah. In terms of the, um, the business case that was put down, uh, looking forward, and in particular about the... Um, the, the the reliance in terms of cast, uh, passenger numbers with Ryanair. We know, as you've pointed out, that <coughs> it's an incredibly competitive business, um, the aviation industry, and um, obviously the two main competitors, if you like, are the two heavyweights in the area, Glasgow and Edinburgh, airports as competitors. And it was just when coming down to actually the projections and knowing the fact that Edinburgh's just been a couple of years into new ownership, Glasgow has found itself in new ownership and there's now going to be a hell for leather battle to get new routes 
into both of these. Was that taken into consideration in terms of the business plan for Presswick, which obviously geographically is at a disadvantage, hence the reason we are where we are at this minute in time, and uh, the reliance on one operator? Obviously, you're not going to be able to tell us how you know, who's been talked to to perhaps um, bring new routes in. That's obviously commercially sensitive, but in terms of um, diversification within what's actually done at Heathrow, uh, Heathrow, uh, 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 Presswick, um, what, uh, how confident are you at this moment in time? I know there's been some good announcements that you made earlier on about the people who are starting to go in, but how confident are we of actually seeing a, a stabilisation, for one thing, of the business <coughs> and actually moving it on to a, a, a stronger footing? I'll maybe ask John Nichols to say a word about that in a minute, about looking to the future, because, as John mentioned, he was at a board meeting yesterday. I think I can only repeat, we have seen some good signs, for example, the freight tonnage. Um, uh, we, we hope once the team is fully in place of non-executive directors that the management will be motivated. Um, Presswick is of a different size of an operation to Glasgow and Edinburgh, and um, th there is growth in, in the wider market, so it doesn't, it doesn't all have to be a, a, an even some game. Um, we believe there are, there are areas that Prestwick can pursue because of its unique um, characteristics. So, as I think I've said earlier, there is a challenge, and as the Deputy First Minister, the then Deputy First Minister, said on a number of occasions when reporting about Prestwick, there is no quick fix, it may take a number of years, but we are confident there is a credible path for Prestwick if some of the key unique opportunities for it can be exploited. John, would you like to add? Certainly. Um, as has been said previously, you know, Prestwick is, is not a, a typical airport in the sense of, of Glasgow and Edinburgh. There, there's quite a range of uh, activity uh, at Prestwick, as well as the passenger operation and, and the freight that we've heard about. Um, there's also uh, the search and rescue. There are uh, fixed base operations, uh, a lot of military activity, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, catered for, um, and uh, there's quite a lot of, uh, of non-operational land, uh, uh, as, uh, which is, is also a potential source of, uh, um, uh, of, of revenue. Um, uh, that said, uh, um, it is a challenge, and as the Auditor General's uh, report does recognise, you know, there, there are um, you know, there are, there's going to be some years before um, you know, there, there is a turnaround. But in terms of uh, how we work towards that. Um, as was referenced earlier, the, the airport management team produced the strategic vision document on the 31st of October last year, largely based on uh, the, the stage two business plan. And uh, the Auditor General uh, has mentioned that that is a reasonable document. Um, at uh, the Prestwick board meeting yesterday, and I, I should clarify for the committee that I, I remain a, a non-executive director of the, the holding company uh, at, at Prestwick, um, uh, um, we were considering, uh, you know, the, the board continues to, to work on the implementation of the strategic vision um, uh, and the management team are, are, are energised to, towards delivering that. Uh, we also um, have uh, uh, approved uh, the budget uh, for, for next year um, and that includes a, a lot of uh, detail on the revenues and costs uh, associated with uh, the business going forward. Um, and uh, over the next uh, few months, the, uh, the airport team will be developing uh, their corporate plan, which will cover a longer period um, and will again, uh, a number of years, and will again be looking at uh, the various opportunities that exist uh, to, to generate additional revenue uh, and, and, uh, and where uh, possible to, to um, increase efficiencies. Um, so uh, th there is a plan in place, uh, as the Auditor General uh, mentioned. You know, it's, imp it's important that we tie all of that down uh, and uh, have a have a, a, a good strategic uh, approach uh, to to the challenges that lie ahead. Um, and, and we're satisfied at this stage that there are um, those good governance arrangements in place, and uh, the plans are being developed uh, to take the business forward. Yeah. So one, yeah. I was just really, are you confident that the loan agreements as agree, agreed over the period and mentioned in the Auditor General's report that the business plan is robust enough that uh, there's not going to be a default uh, in any of these loan agreements? We are confident of that position at the moment, yes. Okay, thank you. Davy Scott. 
Thanks so I wonder if I could just go back to um, some of the earlier point just about the reasonableness of the purchase process, which I accept in terms of, of uh, Audit Scotland's um, findings. Uh, one, of the, one of the aspects that they found, Audit Scotland found, is that the business plan did not model the impact or likelihood of the reliance on Ryanair as its single passenger carrier. Would you like to give some context to that particular point, please? Um, I accept that that's a comment and we, ex we, we accept it. I think it's still difficult to see what modelling would have told us. It's not quite obvious in the sense of, as, as I think uh, Ms Sturgeon and others have said in Parliament, it was quite clear it was either we purchased it or the airport would close. Um, that was a stark choice. Now, there may have been a better way to, to have to, to have modelled it in that sense, um, and clearly the, the, the reliance on one operator uh, was an aspect of that, But uh, and we could perhaps have set this out differently, but I think we were very clear on the circumstances, we were very clear on the choice before us. Uh, totally, and uh, doesn't, didn't that make the point, or doesn't that make the point that the convener was driving at earlier on, that the business case, it would have been stronger as a business case had it explained what, which other options were considered, as a, uh, considered and the reasons for ruling it out, for that very reason? Uh, if we could have explained some of the issues, I think, in a sense, there were, there were perhaps uh, aspects that had been considered in the MAG process prior to, to the acquisition process, so I don't think they were unknown, but clearly if, if it's an aspect of explaining and writing up, then that could have been done, I accept. And, and just finally on this, um, presumably I, I accept your point about Ryanair, but that would illustrate the degree of risk that there was by taking the decision to, to nationalise the airport in that sense because, the, because of the reliance on that single, single carrier. Yes, I think, again, um, and this is where I would, I would never seek to distance myself from the report or imply I'm not accepting the report, but, and, and I've been chided already in interpretation, but it is not that we, we were unaware of the risk. If we have lessons to take on board about how better to articulate the risks and better explain the risks and, and put them in a context which others will find helpful, then we will do that. But and I don't think there was any suggestion we were not aware of risks and that the risks were not quite stark and quite clear which is really what I'm, I was trying to get. Absolutely. Um, could you, thank you, I, I, I think that's very fair. Um, would you, could you detail for the committee the exit strategy for Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government, or is it too early yet to have a clear idea of what that exit strategy looks like? Because I, I assume it is the intention ultimately to pass the airport back to, to our commercial operator. That is the intention, and I think ministers have said that in Parliament on a number of occasions. The hope is that this can return to the private sector. They've not put a timescale on that. I think it's. Um, we hope to see the vision realised. We hope to see Presswick exploit its unique opportunities. Uh, we hope to see it become profitable in its own context, in its own uh, particular uh, niche in the market. And at some point in the future, uh, once that's been established, and I'm not going to put a timescale on that, ministers wouldn't put a timescale out, we're not going to do it, um, then we, the hope is that it would return to the private sector. So the business plan going forward that Mr Nichols mentioned earlier on in the context of the board doesn't as yet have a, a, a doesn't yet have a number or sorry a year at when you expect the airport to break even and therefore ministers would have that option available to them. I don't think we'd like to put any particular time scale, whatever may be contained in commercial and confidential plans. Um, it, 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 it is a challenge and there is a hard road to walk, yeah. we understand that. And therefore the financial exposure to you as Transport Scotland and to the government uh, is at this stage, I don't want to put pejorative language on the table, but it is open-ended in that sense because of the answer you've just given. Uh, well, open-ended is, is, is um, maybe putting words in my mouth on this occasion. Um, I think we think we have, we've quantified the, the investment needs in terms of, of bringing certain things up to scratch, and we've looked at potential investment needs in terms of exploiting um, uh, Presswick's particular assets. I don't know whether, um, Sharon or John, you want to comment further on the, on the totality of potential loan investment. I don't think we'd like to use the term open-ended or we do recognise the extent of the commitment that is implied. I think we're very clear that we need to continuously review it so that when the, and that when each budget is set that we are aware that it is based on uh, forward projection business plans that continue to meet the needs and also meet the market economic investor principle that we are undertaking with this airport. So that is continuously under review. So the final level of loan funding that will be required before it becomes... Um, self-sustaining um, may well change from what's in the report, but we will be continuously uh, monitoring that to ensure that it is viable and justifiable. But it 
is public money, and it is auditable by definition. I mean, my, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but the government's committed to provide 25.2 million on loan funding so far. But again, from Audit Scotland's report, there's no limit on the overall loan funding it may have to provide. I'm just trying to gain some kind of understanding as to what the potential commitment of the taxpayer is to the ongoing ownership of this airport. I think a, f a total for the potential loan funding up to 2020-2021 is, is what's been um, provided. And what figure that, would that that's be, forgive me? That's, yeah. the, that's the number that you've quoted. 25.2 million pounds up to 2021. And that by that point we would be um, expecting the airport to be um, becoming profitable, to be breaking even, then becoming cash profitable, you know, to be able to sustain I mean, I just its own. Want to put that on the record, I appreciate that. Can I ask one just last question, uh, because Colin Keir made me think of it in his, in his early question. Have Glasgow and Edinburgh airports made representations to Transport Scotland about, uh, I think Mr Middleton, you said earlier on that the airport was trying to attract new routes, new development, I quite understand that. I'm not asking you to, to say what those are, but have the private sector airports asked or made uh, representations to Transport Scotland about that? I think both airports have, have, have made concerns known to ministers and I, I, I think to a degree uh, they're in the public domain. I mean clearly if, if they believe their own businesses, their highly competitive businesses was already been highlighted and clearly if they felt their businesses were being affected then, then they would consider their own positions. Yeah. I mean I think they understand ministers' context but although they can speak for themselves but they nonetheless have a clear commercial interest in, in aviation business in Scotland. So, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I want to go back um, to it was the line of question that Mary Scanlon um, undertook. So it's really just a supplementary question, first of all, um, and it's to uh, Sharon Fairweather. Um, Mary Scanlon was asking questions regarding the, um, obviously the, the, the business plan figures obviously being higher as compared to the Department for Transport. Uh, and uh, just uh, it kind of struck me in terms of the Department for Transport. It's not, uh, I haven't looked at their reports on a, on, a, on a regular basis, I hasten to add. Um, but certainly in terms of the, the work that they undertake, uh, do they have any weighting placed against any of the larger airports uh, within, uh, within the UK? We would have to go back into the report and pull out for you the, the information they provide and how they provide their numbers. I don't have that. I'm afraid I don't have that information sure. to hand here. Right. Just, I mean, certainly, I mean, it was uh, yourself that brought in uh, Heathrow Airport into the discussion earlier on, and uh, it's just, it just kind of struck me actually in terms of uh, whether that actually uh, would be something that they would undertake um, when looking at all the airports uh, across the UK. But certainly, if you can, if it's possible to write to the committee with that information, that'd be very useful. Um, certainly, the other the questions, uh, convener, it's uh, just regarding the. Uh, first of all, the, the situation regarding the, the non-executive chair. Now, the non-executive chair um, is the same person uh, for Holdco and PAL. Uh, and uh, does that actually have uh, an effect uh, upon uh, how the, the Holdco board uh, is actually uh, overseeing the airport on behalf of the Scottish Government? I think uh, Audit Scotland have already said the governance arrangements um, are good, but I'll ask John, who's uh, closer involved with this, um, to, to, to elaborate. Thank you. Yes, the, the intention is to um, establish a two-tier governance system. Uh, the Holdco board that was established for the purposes of the acquisition um, uh, and its uh, relationship with the subsidiary companies um, reflects two things. It reflects the, the advice we were given around um, how these things were best done from our professional advisers, uh, but also uh, it does mirror the arrangements put in place by the Welsh Assembly Government for uh, the purchase of, uh, of Cardiff Airport uh, a, a, a little while before. In terms of the um, duality of the role of the, the non-executive uh, chair, um, that's, that flows through from, uh, from, from that arrangement. Um, and just to be clear about the, the, the two um, different uh, roles of the, the Holdco board and the, the operational board, um, the intention for that uh, structure was to create um, an arm's length arrangement uh, for Prestwick so that it can operate and be seen to operate um, on a commercial basis um, without being under the direct day-to-day uh, -day, uh, commercial direction from, uh, 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 from, from central government. Um, the Holdco board is there to uh, um, make that connection between the strategic approach that government takes, um, uh, but uh, to stay away from uh, or keep a, a, a separation from uh, the commercial and operational aspects that the, um, that the, the operational board uh, undertakes. 
The non-executive uh, chair will um, be common to both, um, but the new non-executive directors we are uh, uh, um, recruiting um, will sit solely on the, uh, the operational board and not on the holding company uh, board. Um, that follows the advice um, of the senior advisor um, uh, who produced the stage two business plan and also looked at the, the corporate governance arrangements um, and those recommendations that he made have, have been taken up and uh, uh, followed through in the way I've, uh, I've just described. That's very helpful. Um, obviously, certainly in terms of the situation in Scotland and at Presswick, um, it's been a fairly recent um, development, of course. Um, but you mentioned Cardiff Airport. Um, th is that operation, um, is that the structure still in place at Cardiff and has there been any changes there? Cause I'm just thinking in terms of um, what happens at Presswick and in terms of how that develops going forward. <laughs> I wouldn't like to comment on Cardiff structure. John, do you have any knowledge of Cardiff um, I, I don't have any first-hand knowledge immediately of the Cardiff structure, but I do know that Andrew Miller, uh, the non-executive chair of Prestwick, has, uh, ha has had several discussions with his counterparts at, uh, at Cardiff on, on their experience. Um, so there, there is some, some learning to be, to be had there. Okay, no, thank you. Um, just a couple of other questions. Um, just in terms of the... Uh, first of all, in terms of the, the business uh, case going forward, um, Mr Middleton, in your opening comments, uh, you listed a, a number of, uh, of positive, um, uh, positive aspects, tonnage and Bristol helicopters, etc. Uh, and you also mentioned the, the issue regarding the, the spaceport, uh, obviously Presswick uh, being uh, one of the, uh, the being in the running for that up to now. Um, so in terms of the business case, the, uh, but if the spaceport didn't go to Presswick, uh, would that actually have a, a negative effect upon the actual business case? And uh, if it didn't go there, um, would that affect the, the Scottish Government's uh, ownership of the, the airport? Um, there's a couple of questions in there. Certainly in terms of the business case to purchase, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't dependent on, on Spaceport. Looking at Presswick plans going forward, there's obviously a number of areas they want to exploit. And I wouldn't like to say that if they didn't get the spaceport, that necessarily, um, uh, you know, nullifies their their vision for exploiting their their assets. John, would you like to just say a little bit about how the spaceport um, uh, figures in the future plans of Presswick? Because of course they can't assume any guarantees about it. And could you also deal with the fact of whether, if they were successful, as I'm sure they would be pleased to be, whether that would have any effects on our relationship with Presswick? Uh, uh, with permission, yes. The, um, uh, first of all, the, to uh, expand upon what David's just said, the, the spaceport uh, proposition wasn't known at the time of acquisition, so um, uh, it, it emerged uh, 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 last year. Um, in terms of uh, uh, where we are now, I mean, obviously, um, Scottish Minister's priority is, is for the spaceport to come to Scotland, and there are... Um, uh, three remaining um, Scottish airfields uh, directly uh, uh, in that short list of which Prestwick is one, Campbelltown and Stornoway uh, are the others with uh, a, a, a role for Lucas envisaged uh, possibly by, by the UK government. Um, and uh, clearly it's for the owners of those airfields to decide um, uh, whether they wish to go forward uh, with a bid uh, to the UK government. Um, and um, that, that bidding process um, is now underway uh, and the UK government have uh, indicated they're going to make uh, decisions around it um, in, in October. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are, there's a bit of process to, to be gone through uh, as part of that, in that the UK government are going to be having um, uh, some briefing sessions with um, the airfields who, who have expressed an interest. And, of course, there are um, two others in uh, Cornwall and Wales who are, are part of that. Um, now... Uh, it's probably a little bit too early to say uh, exactly what um, the economic impact of the spaceport um, will be uh, to any airfield that is uh, successful in, in becoming the UK spaceport. And that's something which uh, the airport management team at Presswick are, are, are looking at in conjunction with um, uh, colleagues from the, the stakeholder group, which I, I mentioned uh, earlier on. Um, uh, until we get a little bit further down that uh, that road, um, I think it's uh, it, it's 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 difficult to to give any 
uh, firm assessment of, of what um, uh, the impact will be. But um, what the UK government have said is that they would provide an anchor tenant for the successful um, uh, spaceport bid, uh, and the anticipation would be that um, uh, there would be a you know, substantial impact over the longer term, uh, positive impact in, in terms of uh, uh, what that would mean for, for the airfield which was uh, selected uh, as, as the spaceport. Thank you. Uh, and uh, certainly Mr Norton did say in his opening, his earlier comments that uh, the business case is not dependent upon the spaceport uh, going to Presswick. Uh, but uh, just one final question, and it's, it's a point that was raised earlier on as well. It's not every day that, uh, that somebody takes over an airport, uh, particularly a government. Uh, it doesn't happen on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, so with that uh, being the case, uh, in terms of the, uh, the expertise uh, that, uh, that, that the Scottish Government actually uh, had at the time and also uh, has now. Um, was there much in the way of expertise there to actually assist and facilitate uh, the, the purchase of Presswick Airport uh, actually happening? And, uh, and since then, uh, has there been a, an increase in, in, uh, in people being brought in with expertise to, to actually ensure that Presswick Airport uh, is successful? Well, a lot of the expertise required for the process of acquisition was not necessarily aviation, uh, narrowly aviation related. I think um, Jeanne, of course, is a, a chartered accountant and with external private sector experience in commercial deals. So in terms of acquisitions, we had some expertise and where we needed legal and financial expertise to carry out aspects of that, then, then we were able to buy that in. Similarly, we were able to access um, aviation advice which went in um, to the business plan. But yeah, you're right, it's not every day we do this, and whilst we have transport modelling experience and project management experience, we were able to draw on some of our extensive project management experience in putting together the team that worked on the acquisition. That was one reason why uh, very early after acquisition, uh, we sought um, the, the, the input of a senior advisor who, who knew more about aviation, um, and that's why we have... Uh, since recruited a chair and are currently recruiting non-executives. But yes, it, has, it, it was clearly, um, in, in the broadest sense, a learning experience uh, for many of us. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, uh, convener, and thank you for allowing me to uh, attend this committee. And I, I welcome uh, the fact that the Audit Scotland report recognises uh, that Prestwick is a strategic infrastructure asset that it supports 1,800 jobs locally, that it contributes £61 million to the Scot Scottish economy, uh, supports the MRO hub around it, as well as having defence capabilities and its importance to NATO. So can I just ask, of the diversification options open to Prestwick, uh, which do you see as the ones most likely to succeed? And which would you recommend constituency members such as myself to pursue in terms of our representations when we travel around the country? Um, For example, the spaceport. Well, I think, I think all the, the, the ideas have their own particular story, and I, I certainly wouldn't like to rule any in or, or rule any, any out at this stage. But, but, John, from your experience of the board, um, do, do you have any thoughts of where they would most welcome uh, Mr Scott's input? Um, well, I know um, Mr Scott's interest and input has been appreciated uh, by uh, the various parties um, over uh, a long period of time. So um, I, I, more of the same, I think, would be my uh, response. Um, I, I think it's important that the, the, the stakeholders and elected members uh, um, are continue to be engaged with um, uh, the airport senior management who uh, are probably best placed to, to advise you on exactly how your, your input can, can, can assist. And I'm conscious that there have been uh, a number of, uh, of, of briefing meetings uh, between the airport management team and, uh, uh, and local elected members. And, and uh, I, I, I would suggest that those, uh, those continue. Thank you. If I may ask a final question. Thank you. Um, I just want to... Um, take uh, pursue Tavish Scott's question regarding your exit strategy, which in the Audit Scotland says should be well defined and regularly reviewed. Um, and I just wonder uh, quite specifically if a buyer were to emerge in the short term or the medium term, um, would the Scottish Government 
uh, still consider accepting uh, an offer from such a buyer or is it the airport no longer for sale? I don't think we anticipate buyers because I think the, the nature of the market and the nature of the, the challenge around Presswick, um, it, it, it would be against the run of play to, to expect someone. And if, if someone were to emerge, clearly we would, we would speak to them. I can't imagine ministers would expect us to turn anyone away from conversations. But I think the, the issue to clarify in any conversations is what the intentions of the buyer would be. Because clearly there is no point selling it if, if a buyer was going to exploit the assets in a different way and didn't retain the core business. So I think I would say never say never, but it would, it would seem on the face of it unlikely until we can reach a different position with Presswick, which is what we're all working towards. It would seem unlikely that scenario would unfold. Thank you very much. That, that's all. Thank you. Okay. And finally, Drew Smith. Uh, thank you very much. I think... Um, uh, over the course of the last evidence session uh, uh, and this one, um, th there's a couple of things <coughs> that we all have in common, and that is an understanding of the huge significance of the Ayrshire economy in terms of jobs, um, and also the potential of Presswick Airport as a strategic asset um, for the Scottish economy as a, as a whole. Um, but I wonder if you could, uh, in the context of the loan amounts, um, maybe just talk us through um, some of the, the timelines of that and where they have changed uh, and why, what the reasons might be behind um, changes to the amount. And I wondered if, also, if I could also just clarify, um, in terms of the, the commitment or the need for loan, because um, I think Sharon Fairweather said that the... the, the uh, I wasn't clear if it was the commitment or the need up to 2021, um, was 25.2. Um, but the Auditor General in her report at, 52, at paragraph 52 um, says that the, the, the loan funding requirement um, is 39.6 million. So are you saying that there is the, the difference between those two figures is there's going to be loan from someone else or that's just loan that you understand is going to be required but no one's committed to it yet? Um, no, I think I'll ask Sharon to explain. I think I think there may have been a figure put in, in, a, in a question. We need to go back over the record, which I think alluded to the 25 and I think Sharon at that point may have confirmed that but it may be that, in fact, you're correct, Mr Smith, that these numbers here are perhaps the ones we should be speaking to. But I think, rather than get into the difference between fingers, it might be simpler just to let um, Sharon say a word about the, the loan messages, uh, the loan issue overall. Um, yes, thank you. Um, the, the loan is, is required for, to cover several things, and I think that the Auditor General has very usefully set some of this out in the letter subsequent to her um, appearance a month ago. Um, to cover um, ongoing losses until such time as the airport becomes revenue neutral, rev profit producing, to cover backlog maintenance. There was a need to do um, a different level of maintenance at the airport to bring it up to um, a better standard and to do some capital investment to um, generate further um, returns going forward. Um, and the anticipation is that over the next few years, as the position of the airport improves, they become, first of all, profitable, and then they become um, self-sustaining. So they generate enough cash, not only to cover their costs, but also to cover their capital expenditure, at which point they will then be in a position to start repaying back the loans. Um, and uh, the, the um, acquisition business plan and the subsequent business plan set out the projections for the timescales for that loan funding. So the loan funding will peak over the next three, four years, and then we would expect it the requirement to reduce, and then it will become, um, they'll become cash positive, and they'll be able to start repaying the loan. So that's certainly what is anticipated, and as we were saying, with the business plans going forward, the requirement for funding is continuously reviewed to ensure that whatever further loan funding that we're putting in, we are still comfortable that we will get the loan funding back in the longer term, based on the business plan. Okay. I mean, I suppose... I mean, all of this is public money, so I think, as Tavis Scott said, you know, we, we need to follow the, the public pound in that sense. But uh, an element of that money, in terms of covering the operating loss, well, you know, we've made the decision um, to run the airport, so you know, that's that that's not too controversial, I don't think. Um, uh, essential maintenance um, to keep the airport going, I don't think that would be um, particularly controversial. Um, and not that the third amount would be controversial, but I suppose that is probably the where we would have the most interest in terms of. Uh, where investments are made, we would want to be clear that there are investments that are genuinely based on uh, uh, an expectation that there will be some recoup from that. Um, 
at some point. So, I mean, who, how do we, how do we have confidence um, in those elements of my, of money that 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 is a very robust process? Because it, I mean, I think we said previously. I mean, there is a bit of a danger when you've got public money just standing behind something that we that we simply say, let's explore everything, let's do everything we possibly can to grow this airport, and with the best will in the world, the growth doesn't happen. But it was public money that stood behind it, and it, and it wasn't a hugely robust process. How would you reassure me that that's not the case? We are aiming to operate the, the, the airport as a commercial concern, and therefore we're charging a rate of interest appropriate to that. But in terms of the governance arrangements, so that we're not just um, passing on loan monies, that we, are, we have a process of approving uh, annual budgets and corporate plans. And John, perhaps you could just elaborate on that. Uh, yes, as uh, I was mentioning previously, um, the, 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 the governance arrangements that we put in place and which all at Scotland have, have, have said are, are reasonable are designed to continuously monitor that, that, that business performance and, and, and financial activity. As I say, that happened very recently, just yesterday, in terms of looking at uh, budgets going, going forward. Um, and, and we need to keep that under, under uh, continuous review. Um, I'd also uh, refer back in terms of the sort of public money and accountability uh, points uh, that uh, as the um, Deputy First Minister, as she was then, uh, said to the uh, Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee, um, there have been a number of regular updates to that committee and I, I think uh, she envisaged that that would continue um, over, uh, 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 you know, over an indefinite period uh, or certainly for, for the foreseeable future. Um, and um, obviously that will provide an opportunity to, to examine the, uh, uh, um, the funding uh, streams and, and the loan arrangements um, uh, 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 on an ongoing basis. I would also add that as part of those governance arrangements, the, the management of the airport are required to provide the board with business cases around the capital investments which they wish to undertake, and those business cases are scrutinised by the board as part of that overall governance process, much as we would do with our own internal systems. So those systems are in place. I think that's helpful. So just to, to clarify that in a moment, so, the, so management, if it, if it had an idea um, that this might make a difference, it makes the case to the board. The board would scrutinise that and a, a, approve or send it back. Um, then an application we made to Transport Scotland, uh, and then ministerial approval of that? Or uh, where, where, where I think there's more of a dynamic in it than that process describes, which might fit a more traditional public sector model. But, John, do you want to say? I, I think that's right. I mean... Um, the, the governance arrangements I described earlier uh, uh, were designed to allow uh, uh, a measure of, of, of uh, arm's length uh, arrangements um, and, and that's uh, uh, designed to help us comply with the market economy investor principle and uh, 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 ensure that there, there are no, there's no uh, state aid um, uh, going into the business. Um, I think it's a, it, it would obviously be a matter of, uh, of, of judgment in, in the, um, you know, if, if there are very major decisions that need to be made about the future of, uh, of the business. Uh, but our intention would be that um, the, the holding company will, the Holco board will set the strategic um, uh, 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 arrangements and, and relationship with central government, but it will be for the operational company to take um, uh, you know, the commercial decisions on a, on a day to day basis. So who would, who would finally improve the increasing the amounts of money available? In terms of um, loan funding, yeah. um, if, if there is a requirement for loan funding, additional um, investment, um, then that will necessarily come, come back to, uh, <coughs> to Transport Scotland. To tr rather, and, and you would decide whether or not to involve the Minister or that. It would necessarily be a ministerial decision. You could, well, you could have some element of flexibility within that yourself. I think if we were going beyond any of the figures that have been put in the public domain or uncovered in this report, I think you would assume... In fact, I, I can't imagine circumstances where Ministers would not be informed, advised on, on those matters. That's helpful. Um, in relation to um, uh, the issues around the, the, the possibility of a spaceport, and I, and I thought it was helpful you said that the... the you know, decision to purchase wasn't predicated on that that happening, but it's something that, that's that's interesting, exciting, and potentially hopeful about the the, the future vision. So, I mean, could we assume then that the, the, the Scottish government regards Presswick as its as its preferred location for the spaceport? No, I think the Scottish government's position as a whole is that it would like to see the spaceport in Scotland. But as the as the owner of one of the 
the, the candidates, it doesn't view its own candidate as being its preferred solution. I think it would be invidious for ministers to choose between different parts of Scotland uh, in that way. Um, um, and I think they would stick to their, their neutrality. However, the, the prime hope is it could be located somewhere in Scotland. Clearly, if the decision was taken to come to Prestwick, that would be a good decision in the context of the aspirations for Prestwick. But I think the, the fundamental uh, is that the spaceport should be located in Scotland. Okay. Um, is... Is the Scottish Government uh, involved in, in either the other two Scottish locations in terms of giving advice or uh, support of John, perhaps you could. Um, Stoneway is, is owned by... The report hmm. does, and is the, can we focus on the report? Because the, sure. the, the report's focus is on, and it makes reference to Spaceport in respect of Press Week, so in terms of other areas, I think that would be for another day, potentially. So. Uh, to leave it there. OK, is there anything else... Okay, can I thank the panel for the time this morning and the consideration? I can I briefly suspend the committee for five minutes to allow the witness change of what?
Okay, can I reconvene, uh, colleagues? Uh, agenda item number three uh, will take evidence from Audit Scotland on the AGS, AGS report entitled uh, Commonwealth Games 2014 uh, Third Report. Uh, I welcome uh, Carolyn Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, uh, Angela Cullen, the Assistant Director, uh, Tricia Meldrum, the Senior Manager, and Michael Oliphant, the Project Manager of Audit Scotland. I understand the Auditor General has a a, five minute, a brief five-minute presentation. Thank you, convener. The report we're bringing to the committee today is the third in a series of reports looking at the Commonwealth Games which took place in Glasgow last summer. As the committee will know, we published two earlier reports on planning for the Games in November 2009 and March 2012. Those reports focused on whether the strategic partners, the Scottish Government, Glasgow City Council and Glasgow 2014 Limited, who together made up the organising committee and Commonwealth Games Scotland, were on track to deliver the Games on time and budget. Both reports considered the main risks at the time and how well the partners were managing them. Today's report is our first following the Games. It focuses on the overall cost of the Games and how that cost compares with the budget set, including the financial contribution made by the Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council. The report also considers the Government's and Glasgow City Council's plans for tracking, monitoring and reporting on the expected legacy benefits, which were an important feature of Glasgow's successful bid to host the Games. I'll briefly summarise our findings under three areas, convener, the first of which is the overall success of the Games. We found good evidence that the Games were successful for both Glasgow and Scotland. This included higher than expected ticket sales, positive feedback from spectators, high visitor numbers to Scotland, a record number of participants and a high level of international media coverage. We found that the main reasons for the success of the Games were early planning, a strong commitment from the strategic partners to deliver a successful Games and good partnership working from all the organisations involved. This example of good partnership working, we think, is one that could be spread more widely to other parts of the public sector, since partnership working is becoming increasingly important. Secondly, on the cost of the Games, we found that the overall cost was £543 million, which was £32 million less than the £575 million budget set. Importantly, the public sector contribution was £37.2 million less than expected, with the Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council together spending £424.5 million of the £461.7 million they'd set aside to fund the Games. The remaining costs of the Games were met by income received from private sources such as ticket sales, sponsorship and broadcasting rights. The overall cost included £88.3 million spent on delivering the safety and security operation that was overseen by Police Scotland. The Games passed without major safety or security concerns and Police Scotland delivered the operation within its final budget of £90 million. Finally, on the legacy, we found that both the Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council have developed clear plans for delivering legacy benefits from the Games. The game's legacy covers sporting participation, together with wider impacts on healthier lifestyles, the environment and the economy. The Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council are leading on a range of national and local programmes and projects which are designed to contribute to the legacy outcomes. These outcomes will be measured using a variety of methods, including tracking 58 indicators, an economic evaluation assessment, and a longitudinal study focusing on the impact of housing and neighbourhood regeneration on the health and well-being of communities in the east end of Glasgow. Our report makes some recommendations for the Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council to help them continue building on the good legacy work so far. For example, we've recommended that they ensure that the evaluation due this spring specifically assesses the impact of the investment that they've made on the legacy outcomes. Looking ahead, the Scottish Government plans to report on legacy on an annual basis up to 2019 and will continue to monitor their progress. As always, convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions the committee may have. Before, okay, thank you for that. Could, before I bring Mary Scanlon, can I just ask him maybe a technical point in terms of the evaluation that will be carried out in Glasgow City Council? Who, who would carry out the evaluation of that? The um, evaluation that's being um, that's planned to be published this spring, I think, is being carried out by an external partner. I will ask Michael to pick that point up. It, it's actually a group that's been created um, called the Glasgow Legacy Evaluation Working Group, or GLUG, to give it a short and snappy title. 
and that's made up of different partners, including the Scottish Government, Glasgow City Council, academics, and the NHS, and so on. Can I just ask, in, I mean, from an obvious point in terms of carrying out an evaluation of, of, of your own participation in the, the Games, would that be the normal process of a... I mean, it wouldn't be considered an independent evaluation, then, would it? I, I, I think when there's so many partners involved, including the academics as well, that um, they would provide that uh, challenge to the statisticians and economists that are involved in the group. Unusual convener for it to be carried out in that way by the partners. Um, we certainly will be uh, looking at all of the evaluation that takes place over the coming years to make sure that it is rigorous in the way that you would expect it to be. That doesn't necessarily mean it should be carried out by somebody entirely independent of the partners. Okay. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to put on the record that uh, the 98 per cent of tickets sold. And although the income was 34 million, 6 million less than in Melbourne in 2006, I noticed they only sold 85. And uh, I very much welcome that, that the games were accessible to people on a wide range of incomes. Uh, just got one question, and it is that, uh, Auditor General, I think uh, in one of your earlier reports, you mentioned the security budget rising from 27 million to 90. It was quite a significant increase in the budget, uh, 63 million pounds increase. Uh, in your report on page 22, I see we have the breakdown of the safety and security spending. And uh, it came in two million under budget at 88, but 40% of the spending, 37 million, was on equipment. Uh, I noticed that uh, the equipment included perimeter fencing, airport style security scanners, radio communications, etc. Was the 37 million that was spent by Police Scotland, was that for equipment? unique and solely used for the Games, or will that equipment be used as part of Police Scotland's investment for future, uh, uh, future operations? Um, I'll make a couple of points and then ask Michael to pick up the detail. First of all, you're right that the budget for security did increase from 27 to 90 million pounds. Um, in part, that reflects a recommendation we made in one of our earlier reports, which suggested that the budget may not be enough to, to cover the requirements and the organising committee's um, ability to look at the experience in the London Olympics in 2012 and learn from that experience. The 40 million that you refer to um, within the budget, the 37 million for equipment, yeah, um, is both equipment purchase and equipment hire that was required at the time. And I'll ask Michael to take you through a bit more of what we know about that. Yeah, I, I think in terms of some of the equipment hire, um, you know, airport style uh, security scanners, some of the, the fencing that was used to uh, fence off some of the uh, the venues and the obviously the the. Uh, perimeter area as well and um, it's it's not just your, your standard fencing it is very high tech with um uh, security cameras and so forth on it um some of that is 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 hired there were aspects of the equipment that i think were purchased some specialist equipment including radio communications that can be used ongoing for police scotland so it's a combination of both can I just sort of drill down? Uh, it's my only question, but out of the 37 million, how much would be an investment uh, only for the games uh, and how much would be used, for example, the radio communications? Uh, you know, how, how much of that 37 million w would be a continued investment for Police Scotland? I don't have that, that detailed information to hand, I'm afraid. Okay. Scott. Yeah, can I just ask about, just to sort of follow up, so on the same point about um, security that various scanner is pursuing, I notice in 52, para 52, um, on page 22, the overtime cost for policing amounted to £16.8 million. Did you have a close look at that and, and assess as to whether that, that seems a big number, given the original uh, budget for the whole of security was £27 million. 
ask Michael again to pick up more detail of what we do know. Um, I think within that we have both the overtime required for policing the games within Glasgow itself and uh, support that was given to other parts of Scotland to reflect the fact that a number of police officers were, were pulled in to that, that central location. Um, Michael may be able to tell us a bit more about the yeah, breakdown the, of the, 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 the policing costs that were involved were really, but there were salary costs for the, the planning and the de de delivery team, which um, was in existence you know, in the run-up to the games and, and during the games, but it was also to cover overtime uh, travel and various allowances for not only Police Scotland officers, but mutual aid officers that provided some uh, specialist support coming from other UK forces. Um, that was the, 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 by and large, the bulk of the figure. There was also around £700,000 uh, worth that was described as business as usual costs, which covered overtime for policing in other areas of Scotland to, to ensure business as usual during the Games. And did, did, did other agencies adopt the same strategy? I don't mean strategy, that sounds uh, unfair. Did they adopt the same practice in terms of, as it were, charging the Commonwealth Games for, those kind of, for, the, for exactly the kind of principle that you've described? Ambulance service, fire, fire service, uh, other blue light emergency services. We do we do comment um, further on into the report round about paragraph sorry paragraph 59. We refer to the Scottish Ambulance Service and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Um, there wasn't um, money included within the overall games budget for their additional services, so they were actually additional costs to the games, which we've, we've outlined in the, the paragraph. Uh, the Fire and Rescue Service estimated costs of around uh, £2.2 million pounds, um, for providing you know, services and training and support during the Games. And likewise, the, the Scottish Ambulance Service estimated costs of around £1.2 million, of which half of that was actually provided within the Games budget. So there were additional costs. Um, I think these costs have actually been finalised in terms of what was actually required, but these were estimates that we had at the time of but our audit. These costs are quite small in comparison to the police. Sure. I just wondered why the police cost in terms of overtime was so, is it just a, inevitably it was so large because uh, because of the number of police officers involved, but given the budget it did go from 27 to 90, take your point, Auditor General, we, uh, we called for it, but 27 to 90 is a big, big leap by any standards, and then to spend the thick end of 17 million on overtime, that just sounds like those costs got nearly, well, they ran away with themselves. I think the point we'd make is that the 16.8 million for overtime didn't just cover the 11-day period of the games. It covered the, the planning and preparation and a lot of real-time um, uh, updating of plans and responding to it. Um, we talk, for example, in the report... Oh, it wasn't overtime. It was the point. It was just normal work, but it was charged under the overtime. Absolutely. Okay. That's right. Yeah. The, the, the additional time required to do it came from a range of sources. That's the way the funding worked for it. We talk in the report, for example, that at one point it became clear that on days when all of the major venues were in use, the transport wouldn't be able to cope. So there was a very quick response to planning how that worked, and the police were central to it. To it's that sort of thing, day, so, yeah. indeed. Um, but but to, to the more uh, proper question is, uh, you are presumably satisfied that the, the, the budget moving from 27 to 94 safety and security was justified and is wholly auditable on that basis? Yes, we, we look yeah. closely at that budget heading as you would expect. Yeah. Um, I think it's one of those classic situations, a bit like the year 2000 IT concerns, where had something gone badly wrong and the, the spending hadn't happened, it would be easy to criticise. Everything went smoothly, therefore the question of whether the money is needed is, is open to question. We don't have concerns about it. Thank you. BT. Thank you, Vera. Um, First of all, uh, you know, I, I welcome the support because it's a, a really positive report. I think it underscores the, the success of the Games. We already knew they were successful. It's nice to see you coming in and supporting that, uh, that fact. Um, I think clearly one of the important uh, elements of this is the legacy benefits. Um, I think they're very important. They've always been emphasised. And you've stated here... Uh, on page 25 about uh, there are clear plans in place, there's comprehensive sets of indicators in place. It's encouraging that you say there's already examples of successful leg legacy, although you do qualify its early days. You mentioned about public sector funding. Now, are the legacy of the games predicated on public sector funding? Is that, is that an essential element to make sure that the, the, the legacy uh, benefits are achieved? 
I'll kick off by saying that we always try to make sure that our reports are fair and balanced and give credit for good performance as well as identifying where there's room for improvement. Um, you're right, we do make the clear point in this report that the um, planning for legacy has been good so far and we identify some challenges in making sure that that, that can be demonstrated over time. It's difficult by its nature to show the link between the investment that's made and these types of wide-ranging legacy benefits and we um, have identified a risk that with the continued continuing pressure on public sector budgets, there may be other things that happen that make those benefits harder to achieve, like um, reduced opening hours for sports facilities or higher ticket um, prices, for example. Um, I think the point we're making is that the Games wouldn't have happened without that £420 million or so public sector investment from the government from Glasgow City Council. The success of the bid was based to a large extent on the benefits that were intended to come from um, that investment. And though we recognise it's not a straightforward thing to do, continuing to keep the link on the money that was spent and the benefits that were achieved seems to us important, both in the evaluation that's due this spring and um, over the longer period of time. In particular, I think the evaluation of the Go Well East for the particular benefits for the community in the east end of Glasgow, where the potential to really transform people's lives and their environment is there, but we'll need careful attention to make sure that it happens in practice. So on page 25, the first paragraph you say that there's clear plans, plans for realising legacy benefits from the Games at local, citywide and national levels. Across, this is curiosity really, across the page on page 27, paragraph 65, you're talking about projects in England and Wales as well, legacy projects in England and Wales. Three of them in Wales, one in England. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. I'll ask Tricia and Michael to talk you through the background to that. Okay. So, Le Legacy 2014 is a sort of um, a brand, if you like. So, so a number of projects that meet the requirements of to, to be classified as using that 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 specific branding that was this, that was support associated with the games so that's where some of those projects come in that they do not that they're not just specific to Scotland that they have wider um, benefits a, a, across the UK if, if I can just add the uh, big lottery fund is a key funder in a lot of these projects which is obviously a, a UK organization and that was providing funding towards these these projects in, in Wales and England as well they have access then to the Glasgow legacy uh, logo and so on. Um, and I, I don't know the detail of these individual projects, but I do know that they were designed to increase participation in sport amongst young people within the, the areas that, um, that were selected and that they're drawing money from the, the big lottery fund. I think that answers my next question because obviously I was concerned that public funds might be getting used for projects uh, elsewhere. But if it's lottery money and support to the games, then that doesn't seem unreasonable. Thank you. Bruce Smith. Um, thanks very much, convener. Um, on one level, level the, the Commonwealth Games, you know, a huge success. All credit to, to Glasgow City Council, the previous executive, for you know going for this. And then all credit to the, the council and the, the, the Scottish Government for um, pursuing it when circumstances changed. Because... You know, in lots of ways, the, the environment for doing this, you know, became less than ideal for the, the financial cash. You talk about the, you know, the the pressures on public sector budgets in terms of the legacy, but there was also an impact in terms of, um, you know, people having money in their pocket to buy tickets, in terms of broadcasters being interested in uh, bidding for licences, money for sponsorship, all, all of those things. Um, and so to have pulled it all off in that environment, I think, it, it, you know, it, it is a really um, uh, encouraging um Report. I just wondered whether or not, um, I suppose, on the the issues of of legacy and that that then challenge to because you draw attention to this to yourself. You know, we can only really evaluate whether or not this was value for money over the long term in terms of, of the legacy. But that's the classically the most difficult um, part to do. Um, you know, how big a risk do you think that the the ongoing situation in terms of public sector support for, for projects is to having a real legacy? Um, I think our starting point is that the planning for legacy has been done well. Um, from the, the point of the original bid, the case for um, putting the games on and for investing public money was that there would be a legacy and those 
legacy outcomes were well specified at both the local level in Glasgow and across Scotland. That's a good thing. We also outline in part three of the report the, the, the framework within which that's done, the 58 national indicators, the other things that will measure it. All of that's a great start. And you're right, there is a risk now, um, either simply that people's eye comes off the ball because we've had such a great games and it's been such a great success, or more realistically because there are other pressures on budgets that will continue through the, the years ahead that will make some of those things tougher to achieve than we might have expected back in 2004. Um, there's no, I think there's no lessening of the commitment from either the government or Glasgow City Council particularly and the other 31 councils to making sure that those benefits are achieved. But it's what, why we think that the government and the council's continuing focus on, on what they're getting is so important and why we'll continue to monitor it ourselves. Um, that it, it's human nature almost to... Um, shift attention from what has been achieved onto the next big thing that's coming. We think it's very important for Scotland that the benefits can be demonstrated um, so that when future opportunities like this come up, there isn't that risk of cynicism about what we might be able to do if we put the money in, that we can demonstrate the achievements that were made and really capitalise on the success that was achieved last summer. Yes. Please, Tricia. Mm. Just to add, um, one, one of the positive things that's continuing as well is our legacy leads group that was established in the run-up to the Games to look at um, legacy across the whole country. And um, the decision's been made that, that there's value in that group continuing to exist and so continuing to share things like good practice across what's happening across the country in different areas and um, how, to, how to kind of really roll out that good practice. So again, so supporting some of that work. I think, I mean, for me, the, the, one of the... the the greatest achievements of the games is that, is that it does challenge that, um, you know, our cynicism about things, um, because I, I mean, I certainly sp spoke to people in, adva you know, in advance of the games um, happening, you know, who said, you know, simply said to you, if you were planning this, if you were going for this now in the current environment, you wouldn't do it. Um, but the fact that we were, that we were able to, to persevere with it and do it, um, what are the, uh, are there any key long-term lessons you think for us in terms of thinking about bidding for international events uh, into the future where the timescales are, are so large and there are so many unpredictables um, ahead. What, what are the key things to take from that in your opinion? I think some of the things we say about why this was a success in the report are really important things to not lose sight of. That there was a really strong and clear shared vision from the government and from Glasgow City Council for why they wanted to do this and that worked all the way through into this clarity about what the benefits would be last summer and for a generation to come. Um, that that um, wasn't left as just a sort of nice warm feeling. They, they did the hard work of saying, OK, who's going to do what? Um, how do we make sure our governance arrangements are fit for purpose and the governance arrangements continued to evolve to make sure they could respond quickly to issues that came up as they got closer to the Games? Um, the way in which the planning and financial management was done was a really strong example of responding to differences in, for example, the cost of venues um, that either cost more than expected and had to have money from somewhere else in the budget or cost less and freed money up to invest in something else. All of that worked very well. And you're right, the circumstances in 2014 were very different from the point at which the successful bid was announced. Um, but actually things that we'd reported on as being risky, like income from ticket sales and broadcasting rights, came up either at, at the expectations or above them and that reflects that really strong partnership working so I think for, for us the main lesson is that if you get that right it can have a huge payoff and we rely on that model of partnership working for lots of other bits of public policy just now from health and social care integration community planning other things what lessons can we learn from this in those areas that may not have the same immediate glamour but at least as important in terms of changing the way public services operate and the success of Scotland. I, I, I think there's, the, there's lots of cause for, for optimism. I just had two um, uh, kind of particular questions convenient for me. The first one is just on, on uh, the issue of legacy. You talk about the, the, the challenge of public budgets. I mean, do you think there was sufficient or maybe it was, wasn't possible to do more, but in terms of the, the commercial elements of revenue, where is the legacy from... Uh, you know, from sponsorship, would, were, were we able to convince people to become involved in the success of the games and commit to something bigger than just the games, or 
the, the commercial reality and necessity that people were interested in the, the two weeks in Glasgow and yeah. that was all they were interested in. I, I think the, the initial expectation at the bid stage was that the, the commercial income, particularly sponsorship income, would simply be another source of funding for delivering successful games. I'll ask Michael and Trisha if they want to add anything though about whether the um, result of that was, was different than expected. I think uh, certainly the, the sponsorship was a, a very positive aspect of the commercial income and I think what uh, what that does, not, ne not necessarily just for the legacy but also for the bidding for other future events in Scotland is it al allows the, the commercial partners, all the, the, the different sponsors that were involved, realise that it's p possibly something they want to get involved in in the future. I know Event Scotland have highlighted a number of different world championships that are coming to Scotland over the next year so it could the success of the Commonwealth Games creates that platform for, for commercial partners to maybe sponsor future events as well. Um, just finally, convener for me, um, you've got a specific recommendation around um, the, the Go Well, the uh, research project. Could you maybe just take the opportunity to say a little bit about why you think um, that is important and, and I presume that you think that that is, that is deliverable, that's something that, that could be fairly easily done and, and would be worth uh, spending the time and money to do? Um, I, th I think our view is that as well as the broader benefits to Scotland and to Glasgow from the Games, this, the particular benefits for that community in the east end of Glasgow um, were a key part of the bid and a real opportunity to change lives in a place that has, has dragged behind the rest of Scotland for a long period in spite of great efforts over a long time. The Go Well initiative, I think, predates the um, Commonwealth Games bid, um, but the, there was a specific focus within it after the bid had been successful to um, extend it to get more detail about the lives of people, their health and well-being in this particular area of Scotland. Under the current plans, it will end in 2016, um, and we think that's not long enough to be able to demonstrate the sorts of changes that are envisaged for people's lives and communities, and we're recommending it should be extended to 2026 to give that much richer information about what's happened for that particular group. Again, Tricia may want to add a little bit to that in terms of context or um, our thinking. Mm -hmm. Yep. We think, we think the, the Go West evaluation has a number of strands to it, so we'll give some um, quite powerful information about the impact for those communities. Um, so, for example, one of the aspects of that is face-to-face um, -face interviews um, with around a 1,000 people within the, within the community sort of directly affected by the regeneration um, for the Games, looking at things like their physical activity, well-being, um, sort of experience of the neighbourhood, experience of housing. So, really rich data source there as well with some of the tracking of indicators and outcomes as well. Um, but if you're, you're doing those last interviews and doing that last data collection in 2016 is not giving much time to look at what has been the impact of, of all this work that's gone on. For example, people only moving into the houses in, in 2015, so it's, it's not very long at all. And, and that's a decision, presumably just for the Scottish Government to make, and, and you haven't had a response in terms of publication of the report yet that says they're considering that, but that's... Maybe for Parliament to encourage the government to do yeah. that. It's our recommendation. I think it's a question for government and the partners as to whether they accept it or not. Yeah. Nigel Don. Thank you very much. Convener. Um, could I just go back to Exhibit 6? And, and we note that the military personnel were provided at no cost. Um, I'm not suggesting that you would ever have got the MOD to give you a cost. Um, is there any kind of value? Because presumably their involvement was significant and had they not been there the table in exhibit six would have had some other entry which would have had some kind of number do we do we do we know what their substitute cost was at all we don't know the cost was there, there are costs included in the table that provided for accommodation and some logistical costs as well but actually the personnel um, costs were provided uh, at no charge um, but in terms of what that value would have been had it been included, we've got no information on that. Uh, could I then suggest that for the record, not for this committee's record, but for the future, you might want to evaluate man hours or something? Because there will have been... Maybe it's, maybe it's insignificant. I just don't know. I wasn't involved. But if that was a significant number of people for a significant number of hours, then the total cost that we've got here might deceive somebody trying to do this in the future as to what that total security cost was. I'll just leave that with you, if I may. Can I then just pick up on, on the issue that Drew Smith just helpfully brought up about the Go Well um, 
Could, could I simply endorse your view uh, and encourage you to make very strongly to the government the point the research community will be very, very grateful if we have good, rich data, longitudinal studies. We're talking about health inequalities tomorrow afternoon. Um, and that's precisely the kind of information that we need to evaluate what on earth's going on. It's difficult enough to understand. It's difficult enough to even to theorize on. If you don't have data, it really does become a lot of hot air or there's risk. So I, I'm sure the entire research community would want to encourage you to, to make that point very strongly to the government. And I think this committee's um, backing for that recommendation, if you reach that position, would also be a strong encouragement. Should we know? Thank you. It's uh, just a, it's a comment, first of all, and then a question. Uh, the comment uh, just it's regarding the, the, the ticket sales, and uh, I'm sure certainly if uh, uh, if the Commonwealth Games in uh, last year had a stadium the size of the Melbourne Cricket Ground, where the games were held, uh, then uh, we would have sold uh, even more tickets, and, and uh, the ticket sales revenue would have been even more as well, because uh, that stadium was just uh, around about ninety thousand. So it's uh, but maybe that that's something for the future. Um, but certainly, the, the question uh, it's just it's regarding the I mean, your opening comments, uh, or the general regarding the, this uh, this report, uh, and it's been widely um, recognised that the, the Glasgow Commonwealth Games were a success, uh, and in this report, uh, certainly uh, states that uh, as well. Uh, so, in terms of the, the international perspective of the of the organising of uh, such a successful games in Scotland. Um, what, uh, what can Scotland actually do to really promote? Uh, and it's not something that Scotland does very well in terms of saying actually, we have done something well. Um, it's actually one of, uh, one of the failings that Scotland unfortunately does have. But could, we don't could, just, know. could you just ask colleagues to focus on the question? Oh, no, we can, no, we can a point. Uh, no, sure. Uh, sorry, yeah. convener. Yeah. But just, it's in terms of actually pr uh, telling the, the wider world uh, and actually uh, offering uh, the services um, in terms of the expertise, uh, so that uh, when other big activities are taking place, that people can actually look at what's happened in Scotland and actually learn uh, from, what, uh, from what we actually did last year. Um, first of all, on ticket sales, you're right, 98%, I think, of the available tickets were sold, which is it's hard to see. It could have been much higher in terms of sales or income, so absolutely um, accept the point. In terms of the um, benefits to Scotland from managing this sort of large and complex event. First of all, I think we shouldn't discount the um, intangible, hard to quantify, but very real benefits of Scotland just being on the public stage for that fortnight last summer um, and the benefits that will flow from that. The evaluation should be looking at how we capture it, but we recognise it's not a straightforward thing to put a number on, and yet there is still a value to it. That doesn't mean that value doesn't exist. Um, in terms of the particular expertise, I know that one of the um, components of the agreement with the Commonwealth Games Federation is that knowledge transfer has to take place as part of the sort of wind-down exercise, and I think that's been completed successfully, and the organising committee here has received the payment that was due on successful completion. But Michael may be able to tell you more about the, the bigger picture there, there and what's happening. Yeah, that's a key point, is the... The knowledge transfer, the Commonwealth Games Federation expects a, a level of, of knowledge transfer between um, host cities so that the ongoing lessons learned can be can be applied and, and in this case to the Gold Coast in Australia. I think I think one uh, example that's been uh, mentioned a few times uh, and it's, a, it's a, a tangible example is the uh, the Hamden uh, restructure that took place uh, raising the the level of the playing field to include an ath uh, athletics track. Um, this has become, I understand, sort of internationally known as the Glasgow solution, where sports stadiums can be transformed in, in such a way without necessarily creating the, the white elephants that we've perhaps seen in the past with previous games. So, you know, s I think there's a... Um, there's a positive aspect of, of learning from the, the, the Glasgow Games to other future games, whether it be Commonwealth Games or Olympics. Just, uh, I was very interested in that, uh, in your response there, uh, Mr Oliphant. Was, uh, I was smiling because uh, it uh, kind of took me back to uh, when a new stadium was actually built, the Stade de France, uh, because that's a multi-use stadium. So it's not just for one particular purpose. Uh, and also there, football, rugby, athletics and other activities takes place there. 
and uh, obviously we didn't have that uh, uh, that opportunity here in Scotland. But it's very heartening to hear in terms of the what's, what did happen last year in terms of the Glasgow solution. Okay. Okay, sorry, Colin Keir. Really quick question. Uh, it's actually in relation to case study two uh, on page 29 of the report, and at uh, second from bottom, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, employment and the variety of legacy schemes target the unemployed, underemployed young people. When, and there's a mention of apprenticeships and 203 people helped into work. Is there a breakdown of the type of employment this was, how many apprentices, and are these jobs short-term, long-term, whatever? Um, there's certainly more detail than we've, we've got here. I'll ask Michael to talk you through what we've got now and what we may be able to provide separately. Yeah, I think that, that this is information that we... That for, for this case study, we just wanted to give a, a, a flavour to the type of activity that, that, was, that was going on. I don't know if we've, 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 we've got a, a breakdown of the of necessarily type of jo types of jobs, whether they're short-term or long-term. I think certainly by the nature of our apprenticeships, it would be short-term initially. Um, but on completion, um, you know, it would hopefully be that the, the legs would be there, that they have uh, you know, got the necessary training to, to seek permanent employment, but I don't know the actual detail behind that. It's the sort of issue we would expect the evaluation to be picking up to really get much more detail on the employment that has been created, how much of it is the short-term construction of venues, and how much has that um, converted into skills that are useful much more widely in the economy. Yeah, nice to know, yeah. um, how this has expanded, is it, is, is it a permanent solution, semi-permanent, or mm -hmm. very short-term in terms of uh, facility buildings, you see? Absolutely. Yeah. If I can just add to that, I think it's something that Glasgow City Council have probably been monitoring um, as the work that they did throughout the Games for lots of the contracts that they awarded. They had community benefit clauses and apprentices, apprenticeships and jobs were part of that. So they, we certainly reported on it in our 2012 report of the state of play at that time and they, they should have been monitoring that. Okay, can I thank God the General and our team for the time this morning. I can I now, as agreed, move the committee into private session.